Welcome to the Here's Waldo podcast, where we sit down with top visionaries and creatives in the video game industry. Together, we'll unravel their journeys and learn more about the path they're forging ahead. Now, let's get started with the show. Hi, I'm Lizzie Mintos, founder and CEO of Here's Waldo Recruiting, a boutique video game recruitment firm. This is the Here's Waldo podcast. In every episode, we dive deep into conversations with creatives, founders, and executives about what it takes to be successful. You can expect to hear valuable lessons from their journey and get a glimpse into the future of the industry. This episode is brought to you by Here's Waldo Recruiting, a boutique recruitment firm for the games industry. We value quality over quantity, transparency, communication, and diversity. We partner with companies, creatives, and programmers to understand the why behind their needs. We provide a white glove experience that ensures a win-win outcome. Before introducing today's guest, I want to give a big thank you to Linda Chen for introducing us. Thank you, Linda. Check out the podcast episode with her. It is a treat. Today, we have Jenny Yushu with us. Jenny is a long-distance runner, programmer, gamer, fitness instructor, Forbes 30 Under 30 Games recipient and the CEO of Pilofa Games. She started making games and running at age 12, and in her 12 years in the game industry, she shipped more than 10 titles on the mobile app store with over 9.2 million downloads. She later co-founded the gaming studio Pilofa Games, which just launched a mobile fitness battle game called Run Legends. Let's get started. Hey, Jenny. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Lizzie. Very excited to chat. Yeah. Will you tell me a little bit more about your company for anybody that's not familiar? Yes. So I started Talofa because of my love for both fitness and gaming, like having done games for ever since I was 12, plus having been a long distance cross country runner for almost my entire life. Like it, like the goal of Talofa is to make players more mentally physically healthier through play. So a lot of the reason we exist is for that purpose. And also why the first game that we made was for gamifying walking and running and just getting people out the door. Like there's something powerful about games that we think can be used to actually be an incentive for people to do things that they never want to do, like taking care of their health or they want to do it, but it's just that external push that we're really trying to use like both science bit by science back techniques as well as game design philosophy to really merge into something that feels like aligned in both like the intent and the, the execution and the fun. Will you tell me about the science-based techniques that you're employing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for one, like Run Legends, as you said, it's a fitness battle game, RPG game. And the way it works, which ties into the fitness or the science back part of it, is that it makes when you play the game you have two essentially two buttons you can press like it's kind of like pressing a or b in a game but by going fast you're pressing one button and by going slow you're pressing one button so your speed is actually the controller to the game there's no physical button presses so just like in a fighting game like in order to activate your skill now you're sprinting or you're jockeying and then you're slowing down so just gamifying like the act of going faster and slower it's scientifically backed to induce what people call the runner's high. Like that feeling of euphoria and dopamine and just happiness is something that you do when you go like fast, slow, fast, slow, exerting kind of up to like 85% of your max and then, and then coming back and like continuously going back and forth. So that was one thing where we're like, if we can kind of gamify the process of getting to that enjoyable feeling, then people want to stick around a lot more because they've got both the dopamine rush of winning the battle plus the dopamine rush of the true runner's high. And also there's like an element of like hit training that we've gamified where like going fast for a period of time, going slow, like that's like kind of very classic high intensity interval training. And by making that the way that you like optimally fight in the game, people are more thinking like, I got to sprint because I have to like take down that enemy. Like when I go fast, I'm like dealing damage. Like, let me just like crush the enemy. They only have like two HP left. So that like gaming feeling is tied together with that like fitness benefit. You have, I know you have success stories from people that have gotten fit from your app or 
kind of changed their life. Are there any that stick with you that you could share? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's this story that I remember hearing from one of our players in Discord. He was one of our longtime mods and had followed the game for a while. So in the last year, we were like, that was super early. It was like beta, but just hearing his story of like, he had always kind of been fit all his life and then ended up like becoming like much more of um, sedentary once he had a child and just like kind of always like longed to be fit again, but like kind of felt like he couldn't do it anymore because he had lost the motivation. He said kind of like by playing the game and like having this battle experience and like feeling this sense of like accomplishment through the game, he like finally got to the point where he was actually going back to like he saw his body transforming back to like when he was in that like prime state and just that level of like joy and the fact that he could like find himself again was like super touching. I was like, my goodness, like we're helping this person who never thought they'd be fit again in their life, like be fit. So that was definitely one story that like really resonated uh, with me. And I think one other one was like this, uh, I guess this person who like mentioned just like losing six pounds with the game, like in just one month and just seeing that level of like impact was really cool. Just like seeing that the, the, he was like every day, like posting a screenshots of like the game. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. But then hearing like what that actually did was re- was really awesome too. That's really rewarding. Kind of tricking people to enjoy <laughs> fitness. <laughs> yeah. Game of fine, I guess you could say. Okay, I want to hear more about your company and starting it. But before I want to back up and talk about your overall background. So graduated from MIT in three and a half years with a 5.0 GPA. And then it looks like you started your first company, DeviantArt, in 2011. Can you talk to me about your entrepreneurial journey? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I started making art for DeviantArt uh, and posting on there. So that was kind of the way that the company was started, like, even art was just like this community posting or a site where it was a community of artists. So I'd say like um, posting there as like a creator it was kind of like early creator days. Uh, so my company, JC Soft, kind of spun out of the work that I had posted on the site. And I initially was on DeviantArt because I just love Neopets and then I love Pokemon and I was following a lot of artists on DeviantArt. Uh, so I ended up like posting my own stuff on the site when I was 12 and technically under the like terms of service age, but I just loved like the artists there. And I didn't want to just be somebody who stalked others on the site, like posted my first fan art on there. And then those fan art uh, things turned into animations, turned into uh, interactive animations, which I realized were games. So like I made a bunch of Pokemon fan games when I was 12 and it was all really dumb stuff. It was like, Oh, like, let me like, make a, a game where you like click on a pokeball and like try to like um the pokeballs moving really fast so it's really hard to like win but those games are so fun to like put online and like share with a community and slowly because I was one of the only people making games on DeviantArt like those games would become like the top uh on like the trending page of DeviantArt and then I take those games and put them on the app store so I was a solo dev at the time so I was doing the art I was doing the coding the marketing everything and some of those games like one was called jump scare factory i like put it out on the app stores and like it became like one of the top free games on the app stores and like it was right up there right next to the sims and like that game along with some of the others i created like were covered by some of the biggest youtubers at the time like i think jack sepapai and like markiplier made videos on like the games that i made and this was like early 2010s when I feel like all of that stuff was still super nascent and I didn't know anything I was doing. I was just like putting stuff out under a pseudonym. Nobody knew my real identity. And they're all like, oh, this guy is really good at making games. Of course. Totally. (laughs) But I I think it was just like fun that people were just like loving the things I made and the worlds I created and uh, reading the grammar mistakes I made in the stories that I was telling through the games. And uh, those games ended up uh, that I made under JC Soft help pay for my uh, college tuition at MIT. So that was kind of like the the early start in making a lot of weird like horror games. So <laughs> I 
I was very thankful that like I had put out games at the time that mobile was still very like nascent and very easy to kind of go viral with zero marketing budget. Yeah. What a wild story. When you were at the top with The Sims, how old were you? Mm, I was 15 <laughs> or 16, somewhere around that age. Yeah. And how were you dealing with this as a 15 year old? What were you thinking? Yeah. I mean, it was just this, there was this moment of clarity of like, oh, like this could be a career. I think that was the only thought I had. It was like, oh, what if I could do this for the rest of my life? Like, I love this. And my parents were always telling me like, oh, you can like go to get a nice job in like computer science, like go work at Google, go work at Facebook. And I was like, yeah, like that sounds good. But then this kind of thought emerged at like 15, 16 of like, hey, I've been making this like stuff just for fun. Like I was like making a game every other day, like posting something online. And I just thought it was just nothing, but that could actually, like it was making enough money that I was like calculating. I was like, this would cover rent or like, this would like literally be enough <laughs> for me to like self-sustain. Like this is crazy. And I'm only like 15, 16. I'm leaving my parents home. Like this is all profit. So I think that was like <laughs> just cool. Like, I think I didn't, I think all the like, because I was under an internet pseudo name, none of it was like tied to me. None of my friends knew it either. Like I was kind of just like a quiet kid at school. So nobody knew uh, that I was doing this either. So I just felt lucky. So did anybody know about it? Your your parents, obviously, maybe your parents told their friends or something. Yeah. I mean, really, people only found out in college that I was making games and that they were fairly big since at that time I... Yeah, I guess I was maybe more embarrassed about the games I made. I made dating sims, I made horror games, I made like anime, like games that I felt like weren't very cool and were kind of like cringy or like niche. So I was just like, these are my weirdest like dreams come true and like games where you're like trying to find a murderer or you're the murderer. Or, like they were just stuff that like really felt like an, a representation of me and it felt very vulnerable to like share that with people in my life who were separate from my internet friends. Since at that time I had like maybe 10,000 or something followers on DeviantArt, which was considered high. Now there's even like someone like Linda, who I love very much. She has like hundreds of thousands. Like that's crazy. I was just like with my small like group of like 10,000 uh, followers and just uh, those are my like friends. So I think once like I started finding more like human friends, it was a little scary to kind of like be my full self with them and be like, oh, like gaming is something I do. Um, so the moment that people truly found out about my games is when I got the Forbes 30 under 30. And I actually learned about it like in the middle of my algorithms class, like in junior year of college. And like, I just got the email and I was like, actually it was an email from somebody who was like, I saw you on the Forbes 30 under 30 list. And I was like, why? I was like, what? Like, I didn't even know I got it. Uh, and then it was just like a storm of emails of like, Jenny, like I saw you're on this, like you make games. I didn't know that. So like, it felt like people just found out about me without me like telling anyone. So I think that like sudden, like kind of pulling out of the shadows moment was that like recognition and that award. But before I had never told anyone about it and didn't plan to, but I was kind of forced out <laughs> by it for <laughs> so it wasn't it wasn't voluntary but I I was very glad to kind of meet more people in the industry after that point that horrible moment when Forbes out too <laughs> yeah, yeah it's like I didn't yeah I would be so content being just like that random person who nobody knew what they did so somebody at Forbes tracked you down or you were nominated by somebody that was obviously not yourself yeah, no, it was actually like a funny story because I just, uh, it was on my bucket list actually in my junior year. I was like, I would love to be Forbes. <laughs> and yeah. I like looked it up and I saw there's like a form. So I like self nominated myself and I like copy pasted my college essay. And I was like, this will never go anywhere. I was like, I just threw this in for fun. And then like the next, I think like four months later, I learned that I was on the list. So it was kind of one of those moments where I was like, yeah, I kind of put myself out there. Maybe there are other people involved. I think that I definitely didn't think it would happen like the year I put it on my bucket list. But yeah, I was like 20. So I was not exact. I was like, I have 10 years to do this. Um, it was, it was very, very, I was very thankful. Like, I think there was probably some other like force at play, like somebody else that 
had probably nominated me because my application was really bad. I don't think that was the thing that made it. Uh, but I, I do think that uh, it kind of made me think about more like, what is my public persona now that people know yeah. who I am? And like, how do I present myself like as a game dev, as like somebody who like people might like look to and be like, oh, like that person like does games, like I should talk to them. Yeah. How did you start that? Not maybe I was going to say self-discovery process or I guess realization of process and how to present yourself to the world, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of it, I think a lot of the the mentors I found along the way since college was the first time, especially after that uh, Forbes announcement was when I started talking to people in the industry. And I did not realize that the, there were people like real people like trying to do the exact same thing as me and kind of talking to people along the way. Like I heard how they were running their companies. Like I uh, very early on, I met um, like Kate Edwards from like at the time she was running the IGDA and she was like probably the first person in games I ever met. And I was just like, wow, like you're living my dream. <laughs> like I would love to be like one day kind of somebody who has that much impact on the industry. So I think just like honestly emulating a lot of the people that I saw, like Kate, like um, one other person that I really looked up to in the very beginning was Sam from Butterscotch and having like those people really take me under their wing and be like, here's how you like fundraise or pitch publishers. And here's how you like actually start a company. Cause I'd essentially show up at these events, be like a 18 year old or 19 year old and be like, uh, I guess at the time, 20 year old, when I got the award and be like, hi, like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like I would yeah. like to be in games. I've made all these games that like paid for my college and kind of naively asking everyone, like, how did you do it? So I had no shame. I asked, I also went through like all the people in the MIT list of alumni who ever worked in games. I think there are 30 of them. And I asked to call all of them. And I had probably like 20 or so like random internet coffee chats where I was just asking every single MIT alumni, like, how did you do it? How did you do it? How did you do it? And then like kind of averaging out their experience and being like, oh, like I can do that too. So that was also part of it was like, a huge shameless push to external people. <laughs> yeah. Well, no one really knows what they're doing at all. <laughs> like even the people you think know what they're doing are just yeah. making it up and asking for help too. I mean, they probably did that. And I know you ended up partnering with Niantic. How did that come to be? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was actually at a time that I totally didn't expect since I had actually like I was in this period of time where like I had no job. All my friends already accepted offers. It was like three and a half years out of college. I was like, I graduated, but I had no plan. So it was like, uh, I thought I was going to do something and that didn't pan out. So I was like, oh, now I'm like, I truly have no job and I've missed the window for full-time job applications. And I was really like depressed at the time. So I was like laying down on my bed a lot. And I was like, what do I do with my life? I thought I had like lost some spark in me where I was like, why did I peak in high school? I literally peaked in high school. Like I made so many great games. Um, I hadn't had a hit in a while, like kind of in college. So it was like a moment where a lot of people are telling me like gaming is really hard. Don't do it. Like honestly, most of the mentors were like, I wouldn't do it. Or like this industry is too hard. Like don't do it. If I was going to go back, I wouldn't do it. So I think just that like kind of negativity plus like my own like depression was like really hard. But then I talked to like a mentor of mine and she was like, oh, actually Niantic has like this contest because I was telling people like, I kind of want to mix like fitness and gaming because I love these two things, but I never made a game about it. And I pitched her this idea and she was like, you should totally apply to this Niantic contest. So there were like five days left in the contest uh, like to apply and it was already extended a week. So I was like, I wouldn't have made it if they didn't extend it. So I submitted an application. I put me, my uh, my dad and my brother on the application because they said that there's a minimum team size of three. And I didn't get their consent um, before I did it. I was just like, they will definitely say yes. And this application is due, so I'm going to do it. Uh, and then we ended up getting in. And I was like, oh, shoot. So then I pulled together. like I was like, hey, dad, hey, brother, I accidentally signed you up for this. Like, you want to do it? 
So then my dad, he was the one who like fully came on board, like helped me out. Like we pitched to like the CEO of Niantic, like at the end of that contest, like our final game and our prototype. And by some like random stroke of luck, we ended up winning. They gave us $300,000 and that amount of money at the time, because it was just me and him, it felt like significant enough to kind of reinvest and be like, all right, this is enough money to give it a try. So that's like how that Niantic partnership happened. And we worked with them for another year and a half, I guess year and a half total, including the contest. So they helped fund us even more beyond that contest, given like our idea of like a social running game that gets people outside. So um, I think that was really what got me like my, my head start was this contest, really random contest and kind of the support of the team that I admired a lot. How did you learn how to pitch just from your mentors from school? Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of trial and error. I think Niantic really pushed us to like pitch and get better. And I, I honestly look at some of my slides from when I first started pitching and I like cringe because I remember putting them together, having no idea what I was doing. And I don't even know how we got the green light because they were so bad. We were, I like made up this person. I was like, like Sarah is a mother and she has no time. We are making a game that gets her fit. And like, it was really ugly art everywhere. So I think my first pitch was terrible. And then having learned a little bit like Niantic, uh, Kelly Santiago, who was there at the time, she helped really refine our pitch and she was like let's practice a lot like here's how you should edit the slides like highlight these things um, make a really cool like demo and like put it here so I think that like process of going through Niantic screen light process like helped us a ton and then when I ended up going to VC backed her out that was a whole nother beast because I didn't realize kind of the art of fundraising for investors is very different from pitching like a Niantic who is like a game publisher so that was another kind of slap in the face where I pitched so many people for a pre-seed or just to get some money and ended up like getting almost all no's and people who were like, yeah, here's slides, you need a lot of work. So that I think just going through the real like pitch process with like investors was like a second level of like learning where I thought I knew everything. I knew nothing. And even now it's like pitching is really scary, but I think just having a lot of mentors help out, having a lot of time to practice and just real practice getting rejected was really helpful. You told me the best story about pitching at Game Speed. Do you have any other insights into how you actually ended up getting funding? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I feel like for my like my first round of funding, like it was this time where we actually had like, I think three months to live as a company. So we were like, we had a big team like coming out of Niantic and like having no more funding from Niantic. I had to essentially let go like half of my team at the time. We went from like a team of 17, which is crazy because I was like a 23 year old running a 17 person team of everyone older than me. Like, I already thought that was crazy, but having to kind of fire people or let people go at that age too is like very emotional. And then also with the pressure of like, honestly, when we had kind of been, when we ran out of Niantic money, like I heard later on that my team had calls where they were saying bye to each other because <laughs> they thought it was the end. And they're like, we're never going to work together. Like it was a good run. Like, um, I'm so glad that we were together on this team, which we love so much. And I was just in like, let me, let me like solve this problem mode where I talked to, I actually ended up, um, uh, having a lot of success. Cause I, the only person who ended up saying yes, when I did all those pitches was somebody that I met through a fitness class that I taught. We are like, I was running this like fitness program during COVID called abs with Jenny. It was a online zoom five minute abs class. And I invited all my friends and their friends and their parents, significant others, Tinder matches to join. So <laughs> there are like, I think 800 people at this point who have come to Abs with Jenny. And one of them happened to be a VC. And she ended up telling her other VC friend that they should talk to me. And I didn't think it turned into investment, but they were like our first check-in. And it kind of came in a really random way. So. That was like how we got started and then kind of having 
uh, we had, we raised like two other rounds after that one, but uh, that was like the first check was definitely the hardest, and also at a time where like we were really desperate. I heard I heard that it was so obvious how desperate I was that like kind of from one conversation they knew I was like I only had three months of runway, and yeah, so I really got like lucky, and I I kind of learned that the way I present myself, uh, even in those calls, like was very uh like if I didn't come in with a lot of confidence it was obvious so that yeah. kind of made me self reflect a lot and like coming in with more confidence like presenting myself in a way that inspired confidence not just like presented it so yeah how do you train yourself to inspire confidence in a pitch yeah i mean for me a lot of it is that i cannot be confident without truly believing in it i'm very yeah. I think when it feels authentic, it's the easiest. So for me, it was like finding certain things I was really proud of and like anchoring on those. Like we are really proud of the fact that we had Niantic's backing and Niantic's funding. So really like hammering on like, hey, I have made games for my entire life. I'm really young, but like I went to MIT, studied computer science, like have this unique background in fitness and gaming. Like the background was something unshakable. Like you can't be unconfident in your past because it already happened. So like really shifting to that and selling my background was how I ended up pitching my first round. It was like, hey, just believe in me. And at that early stage, like it is all about like the founder. So I think that yeah. was really how I learned to be more confident. And now like I can be more confident in things like certain stats we've hit or certain milestones, like getting featured on the app stores, like all those things. But when I, the first round, you don't have any of that. So it's like truly just confidence in yourself. Yeah. And doing a thing that you are so passionate about picking to work on a thing you're so passionate about. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think the like raw passion for like, when people would ask me like, why are you doing this company specifically? Like that answer also comes out very authentically. It's like, I love fitness. Like I love games. Like I taught fitness. Like I got certified as a group fitness instructor. Like this is what my life is for. Like that type of message, like it rings true. But if I'm talking about like things like, oh, like this market is so large and like this is billion dollar yeah. opportunity. Like it's much harder to say that with like as much confidence as I do in like my passion. Yeah. Conviction is huge. And then, okay, you had, you had 17 people, you cut your team in half. And then where did speed run come into this? Yeah, yeah. I ended up applying for speedrun kind of after a uh like it was super random cuz I I went to GDC in like this year and that's where I met some folks on the Andreessen team like at a party they were hosting and I just remember like meeting this like one of their like games team members at the party and he was like, "Oh, like um you should totally apply for speedrun. You'd be like perfect for it." And I remember thinking like he probably says that to everyone. <laughs> like, I <laughs> don't think I'll get in, but I'll, I'll definitely try. So I like ended up throwing in an application kind of last minute, hearing about it at GDC and getting like a follow up email from um, Andrew Lee on their team there. So he was the one we met. And uh, we ended up like having like I didn't or I got the email that we like got selected for like the next round interviews and it would be like some super like intense interview. And I remember coming out of that, like being like, I totally failed. Like my whole back was covered in sweat. And I was like, I really want to get it, but I don't think I got it. Um, and then hearing about it, like getting the call that I got in, I was so happy because we were also like months away from running out of money when speedrun happened. And we just got that investment. And it was like, oh, thank goodness kind of moment for me. Uh, and just the whole process of like going through speedrun, um, that was just, I, we were also launching a game at the exact same time that we did speedrun. So it was both like, um, it was great, but also so stressful that like, I was, I almost convinced to like not join speedrun because of the timing. Um, but it ended up being really good. Like we launched the game in the middle of speedrun, had demo day, like ended up having like a lead offer for our next round, like in the middle of speedrun too. He negotiated that. And then by the end of speedrun, like had all of it like really come together. So I think I did not expect it to go 
as well as it ended up going kind of given just the market has been really hard. And I know a lot of my friends like have struggled to get funding. So um, a lot of it was in a way like um, luck and timing, but also like kind of that, like, I always like believe that it will, I think I've always had this belief that kind of, if I put my mind to it, it will happen. And it was just never giving up, even though like, I think pitching, I had so many no's. I pitched like a hundred people for our seed round and I ended up getting yeses from like five people or something like that. So it was just like a hundred pitches later. Like I was just pitching so often that I couldn't even um, keep track at some point. Um, but it was just never giving up even after a hundred pitches. Yeah. I think the the Canva founder was knowed so many times and look at Canva. I mean, look at your company. <laughs> Thank just you. Persistence. Yeah. And I can relate to, yeah, just ups and downs, like things happen. It sounds like every time you've been close to running out of money, you kind of put yourself out there, but then from that, something happens, everything comes together and you're able to continue. Yeah. It's always this like thing where I'm like, I never regret continuing to keep pushing. Like there's this, I guess what I truly believe is that like people don't get lucky. They just you just put yourself in enough situations that you get lucky because you're there when the right combination of like, um, like opportunity, like timing, like, and like, I guess you coming into the picture is just like a perfect match. And then it's like that lucky moment happens. And I think for us, those lucky moments were like, when I got that, uh, first, when I entered the Niantic contest, then winning that one and then getting through green light and then getting that first check. And then having our second round, like almost not come together. And then having like our third round of funding, like finally come together, like each of those moments right before I had many thoughts of like, should I give up? And I remember actually last GDC, not this GDC, but GDC 2022, I actually like was talking to some gaming founders and then like kind of spontaneously while talking about my game, I just started crying because I was like, I don't know why I do this anymore. Like I don't have passion anymore. I feel like I'm always just pitching. like my game's going nowhere. Like, and nobody's playing the game. Like there's zero product market fit. And just like that moment of like, I hate what I'm doing. Like, I still remember feeling that 2022, but like now kind of a year and a half later, like knowing that if I had quit then I wouldn't have done speed run. I wouldn't have met like all these amazing people like Linda and the rest of the speed run folks, like not meeting you. Like it just crazy how that like kind of difference happened and people who met me in 2022 like meet me now and they're like you're just a different person <laughs> and it's it's kind of true because I think that the amount of just learnings I got from going from rock bottom to like a point at which I still feel like we haven't figured a lot of stuff out like we haven't necessarily found like complete product market fit but we have some traction and some cool numbers to share like that like me as a person like our situation is the same. Like the company still needs to like prove a lot, but like just working through that like emotional battle and coming out on the other side, like still motivated. I think I refound my passion for games and yeah, just have grown better as a leader, like through that whole like process of death to not death. Yeah, it's a big process. I went to a conference and the founder of Remitly was talking. He's 36 and they're a unicorn. And he said that some days, actually within an hour, you're like, this is this is the best day. My company is doing so well. And then an hour later, you're like, nope, I'm going to have to shut my whole company down. And you just have to manage the ups and downs, which I think is true. And I like what you said about, I think this is true too. The harder you work, the luckier you get. Like the, the harder you work and the more you put yourself out into these situations. And I also feel yeah. like if you tell yourself it's going to work and you have that focus, then maybe you see opportunities that you wouldn't also see. Yeah. That's my life. Yeah. My, my life outlook, I guess. Can you tell me about fitness? I'm curious about your passion for fitness. And I saw that you invited some of your investors to Barry's boot camp. And when we went to Games Beat, you're like, I have to go to Soul Cycle afterwards. So I love your dedication. How did this come about? And yeah, yeah, I know. I love fitness. I'm like, if anything, I put my confidence in myself and fitness. 
Like I, my company might not be as successful as yours, but I can beat you in a mile. Like that's kind of what I, uh, I, I say that to myself mostly because I, I'm somebody who's hyper competitive. And like, I think that is, is a really good thing as a founder, but it's also really depressing sometimes because you'll never be the best and yeah. you'll never, I think even just comparing is like the killer of joy. So I, I take out my competitive spirit in my, my fitness. And I started swimming very early on. So I started swimming competitively, competitively at age nine. And then I stopped and I was 13, but I really didn't like the water. I didn't like getting wet. And it was like a weird thing to be a swimmer and not liking getting in the water. But I just always found it like weird because I was like, there's so much effort getting into the water, like me putting on a swimsuit. So then I learned about running in middle school because there is this thing called like the pacer test where like you run back and forth and like you hear the beeps and you have to get to the other side before the beep happens. So I was doing the pacers test like one day in middle school in sixth grade. And like, I was just like, oh, this is so fun. So fun, so fun. And then eventually I was like the only one doing like, like still in the game. It felt like a game, like a survival game. And then like basically PE class ended and I was still running back and forth and like hitting the pacer test because it was getting getting faster and faster. So like at that moment, my PE teacher was like, huh, Jenny, do you like want to try out for track and field? So then I ended up doing like um, doing my first track and field race. And I think the first mile I ever ran, I got a 530 in sixth grade. So I was like, oh, shoot, like, I guess that's a, an OK time. Um, and then I and then I like went full in on like, let me actually train in running and like see what I can do here, because I didn't know what it'd be like. I didn't think I'd be in, in high school athlete, but I, I got recruited I guess, by my PE teacher and ended up like running a ton in middle school. Like then I ended up like joining cross country track and field in high school, too. And I actually in that period of time, really didn't like running. I think I was just good at it. Like there is some level of like, there's like talent. And then there's like people who like try really hard. And I was just like the talent. And I like really took it for granted, like my speed. And I was just always like, uh, I won almost every single race I was in. And it was like this kind of weird situation where like I developed like this love hate relationship with it, where I loved winning, but I hated practice and I hated being on the team. And Kind of the amount of stress I felt before every race was crazy because I was told like this is your ticket to college like you have to win because like then you'll go to the best colleges get recruited by the best teams so I spent a lot of time like on fitness like I think more so than school and I um I didn't like it at all like I didn't interact with the team that much my coach was great but I I don't think I was a good team sport either I'd like cry every time I lost so I was like way too competitive and then uh, I also got, so I got recruited to MIT and a lot of the time, I think that's like why I got in <laughs> it's like through sports. And I, I think that being on that team was really humbling because being in a college sport, you're no longer the best because everyone on the team was recruited for being the best at their school. So then I was like coming in like 200th place, like at nationals. And that was super humbling. I was like, I'm only, I've been so used to being in the single digit places. Like what is 200th place? Like, I'm just like, I was almost the last place in that race and I was extremely humbled. So I think after college and just having done that like program, like we were doing like 70 miles a week. It was like really intense. I only started to love running once I quit the team and ended up doing things like berries where it was fun and it was social and I didn't have to run just to win. I actually loved the feeling of running. It's like rediscovering my love for fitness and realizing like how much joy it brought me like really made me want to like uh, do something in that space. So that's like where, where that love of like fitness came from and things like Barry, Soul Cycle, like all these like more boutique and like fun, like cult-like fitness programs yes. <laughs> were some of the ways that I feel like I got really motivated. So it's like, how do we bring Barry's bootcamp level fun to like a game? So that's that's a lot of like how how my journey to fitness has been. And I guess also like some level of like insecurity with like how I looked or like my physical appearance. And I was always really upset about the way I looked. And like, I really thought that like fitness was like an outlet for that, but it was like unhealthy. So like I started learning more about nutrition and like having a more healthier attitude towards exercise, like throughout my like post-college life too. 
So I think that journey too, like if there is a way to bring that into like the stuff we create as a company, like I think those personal journeys like really make me want to, um, like those are messages I'd love everyone to learn the less painful way that I did. I think I'm really into fitness too. We should do fitness together sometime. Yeah. But I'm really into Pilates right now, specifically the Ligurie. I do it a lot. It's kind of culty. Um, but I really think for me personally, and what I've seen in so many people in my life is that when your fitness is consistent, the rest of your life is consistent. And it really, t- for at least for me personally, ties together. Like if I work out regularly, my mental health is better. My whole life, I would say, is just better. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like a, the inertia is very high to like getting into a very consistent routine. But the moment you do, like feels great, like feeling fit. I remember talking to people and they're like, I just love being fit because you just feel great, look great. And it's so easy to continue. But then like they are not fit and they just like, but they like relish those days. And they're like, I just want to get back to that, like that routine because it's easy to continue, but so hard once you've fallen off like a single day. Totally. And there's a lot of things with work or life or fitness where you know, the thing you need to do, like, you know, you need to work out and you know, you're going to feel better when you do it, but you just kind of have this blocker around. Yeah. Yeah. But if you gamify and you're just playing a game, then you're in on it. What do you wish you knew when you started your company? Like, what do you know today that would be helpful to know besides pitching? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think a lot of it is finding the right people. Like I, I think that I spent a lot of time, like really like undirected and like, I like for most of my career, like I was just making stuff like with my head in the dirt and I was like, I'm just going to make like the best game possible. But what I've learned across the years is like, it's not just about like the work you do, but about like the network you create and like the people you meet like kind of surprise you in ways that you can't do by just like grinding it out on your own. Like I was a lone wolf for like most of my career. And I actually thought like very naively, like I'm better alone. Like I don't need a team. Like I don't want a team. I don't want to meet other people because I just want to spend all my time making stuff. And I've always been wrong. Like there's every time I'm like, uh, like I not enough energy to go to like game speed or something. Always surprised. And I think that it's really the power of like, friendship and uh, people in the industry who like you can share stories and share shortcuts because in a lot of ways like I did kind of forge a lot of my initial career like kind of just blindly and I didn't have to if I just asked for help so I think learning to ask for help was really important and um, I even think just like if I were to tell myself like people leave people will leave you and that's okay. (laughs) That learning I learned very recently, but like I used to cry every time people would leave my team or like I would lose some opportunity. And yeah, that would always like hit me the hardest because I was like, it's like a breakup, (laughs) but multiple people can break up with you because you have lots of people at a company. And like knowing now, like, hey, it's actually good to have some turnover and people better come in and that type of, um, growth was also something I learned along the way. So I think now I feel a lot more like, okay with change and okay with things also not going my way because I'm not able to predict the future as much as I used to think. Like, I think when I was early on in my career, I was like the very start of like the Gen bars curve. And now I'm like on the other side where I feel like I literally didn't know anything when I started. And now I'm like much, much more able to ask for help and even more aware of how little I know about everything that I, I almost feel like I'm right back at the start where I feel like I'm just as in need of help as I first started. Yeah. Everyone needs help. I met with my friend yesterday who's three different massive businesses, the most successful person I know. And he's telling me about his mentors and I mean, they're even more successful, but yeah, everyone needs help. Always. Do you have any teasers about what we can look forward to seeing from you and your company? 
Yeah, I mean, we're dropping a new trailer soon for Run Legends, which is really exciting alongside the biggest update we'll have for the game. And uh, I'd say like, look forward to that in the new year or so. Like we've just got a few months left here and we're cooking up some really cool stuff. So uh, yeah, I, if you download Run Legends today, you'll get that big update when it comes out. But we're we're really excited to show that off. And we're also cooking up kind of new ideas behind the scenes too. So um, yeah, I guess follow and <laughs> find out what it is. So I'm, I feel really lucky to have a team that honestly, like is really supportive, like really healthy. Like, I think I learn more from my team often than what I can help them with because I've hired people who are much older than me, have more experience. So just that amount of like kind of mutual learning that I find from my team, like, I think we'll cook up some really cool things in, in the new year. I'm excited. I have one last question before I ask it. I want to point people to your website at T-A-L-O-F-A games.com. My last question is, what do people not know about you? Do you have any oh. like strange, strange, I don't know, like quirks or hobbies or anything that would be unexpected? Yeah. I mean, I guess I'm really into like really dark psychological horror like really niche, like weird uh, anime and manga. It's so, like, that's like what I love so much. So like, I'll always take recommendations for like the most messed up stuff people can find. Um, like I, I used to really like, like, uh, like true crime and like all of that and um, kind of stories about like murder mysteries were like my favorite. So yeah, I guess that's like not what people think when they meet me. Cause like I now... I it used to make more sense because I used to make horror games and like it was very on brand. But now that we're making like wholesome fitness games and stuff that has no ties to anything dark or weird, it's often surprising. People are like, I cannot believe you're into such messed up things. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, but like, I love it. Like it gives me inspiration. It's just fascinating to me when there's like unsolved crime or some like really messed up like thing that just highlights something in human psychology so i i do often read up on like psychology and and stuff like that well the psychology aspect kind of plays into your game so yeah currently yeah. yes we'll i guess it's not that far of a stretch um, yeah but it is something that I, I i like to bond with people over too i look forward to twisted games from you in the future <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah run otherwise you die <laughs> We've been talking to Jenny Shu, the CEO and founder of Talofa. Where can people go to contact you, follow along with your company, learn more about you? Yeah, yeah. And you can follow our game account at Play Run Legends on X, on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. And we're also at, at Talofa Games. I'm at Jenny at TalofaGames.com. That's my email, as well as uh X U Jenny C on X. So yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really excited to chat with people who are interested in weird horror stuff and have recommendations, or just want to chat about just what it's like to to be a founder um, straight out of college. So yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for listening to the show this week. To catch all the latest from Here's Waldo, you can follow us on LinkedIn. Be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes. We'll see you next time.